we begin in the name of God. Greetings to you all. Welcome to yet another session of From the Desk of Kramdi. Our discussion continues in the 23 question series and today we begin the 155th episode. What is Hadith? This is our topic today. Today we have the 21st episode on this subject. Let's begin. Kramdi Sahab, thank you so much for your time. The chain of objections had started with the verse 44 from Surah Nahal in the Quran. It is said that Ramdi Sahab's statement that it was not the Prophet's, peace be upon him, official responsibility to proliferate hadith is negated by the Quranic verse. We discussed that verse. According to you, there were three stages to consider. First, one must scrutinize the words, then examine the sentence structure, followed by the context and the backdrop. We were passing through each of these stages, Gamdi Sahab. The point about the words was clear. In order to explain this process of clarification of the words' meanings, you had used the word Iza. Another aspect was also mentioned in that regard. So now, having looked at this discussion in the light of both the subject and the object, how must we understand this verse? The point was clear. I wish to take this point further and explain what aspect we are considering in this verse. I said that whenever the Quran would be understood, there would be just three stages to it. First of all, it is that as per the lexicon or according to its usage, what meanings are contained within the word? All right. I had said that essentially it's in the sense of Iza and has been used in general, but we find it being used often in two ways. I had presented the verses of the Quran and elaborated on both those aspects too. Now, before we move any further, we should see how our exegetes elaborated on it. That is, whether they mention both aspects, or they show a preference, or give a certain perspective, or choose a particular view. What is the situation there? I will present excerpts from the great exegesis books. You are aware that the source books of this science were written by Tabari Zamakshari, the author of Al Kashaf. Then there's Imam Razi and also Ibn Ikathir. We start with Imam Tabari. With regard to Tabari, you know that he does not only express his own opinion, but prior to it, if there are some sayings from the companions or their followers, then he quotes them too. In Tabari, verse 44 of Surah Nal is discussed. He has reported just one opinion for this particular word. That is, it suggests that by his time, there hadn't been any debate about it. If there was, he would have reported the sayings of the companions and the followers about it. Then, as per his usual style, he states which opinion he prefers. He never mentioned any such thing. He writes, Wa anzalna ilaika zikr. O Prophet, we have revealed this reminder towards you. He explains the reason why the word zikr was used in this case. He writes that the Quran is the means of tazkir, remembrance for people. Like we, on various occasions, draw attention that the Quran is naziral lil alimin. So he stated the reason for using the word zikr. Then he considered the word litubayina lin nas. Isn't this what we are discussing? That is, the word tabin, the meaning in which it's used. Note, he says, لِتْوَرِفَهُمْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ مِنْ ذَلِكْ That is, the reminder that was revealed familiarizes people with what was revealed for them. Meaning people are introduced to it. That is, it is told, it is communicated to them. So, the definition, the introduction of it, to familiarize them, to tell them, to state, to convey it to them, is the idea he adopted. The first aspect. He doesn't mention the other aspect at all. That is, according to Tabari, there is just one interpretation that he mentioned. He didn't go on to discuss any other likely aspect, like explaining and elaborating. If he preferred one, what's the reason for it? He doesn't even mention that while writing the exegesis, there was any debate among the successors of the companions, or even before, among the companions. There is just one point expressed with one word, and he said that, according to him, it's in the sense of stating it, not explaining or elaborating. Along with it, the point is also made clear that the point which actually is aimed to be stated is the guidance. That is the guidance of God stated in the Quran. There, the beliefs are stated, God's Sharia for people is mentioned, 
God's directives are stated, do's and don'ts are mentioned. To communicate the message revealed to the people, to familiarize them with it, this is the meaning of the verse, and this is what he said. Secondly, I have drawn your attention to the fact that in all the commandments that have been given in the Quran, common sense exempts those who are not fit to be included in them. For example, a child of a very young age has committed an immoral act. For example, in the case of theft, you have seen that a child has taken out two rupees from his father's pocket. To the extent that it is misconduct, clearly an act has the thing revealed to them should be elaborated, Tabin. This is the verse's subject, so he states it. He says that is Ma Nazalallahu ilayhim fiz zikr. That is, first he expanded the object and explained that in Ma Nazalallahu ilayhim fiz zikr, it doesn't imply the Quran, rather the guidance in the Quran. Its content? It's more or less the same point as Tabari, that is, its content. Obviously, what is the Qur'an's content? That is, what's its content? God Almighty's guidance. Be it regarding beliefs or the Sharia, or regarding morality, directives, or do's and don'ts in the religion, or warning and punishment, that is, the Prophet, peace be upon him, conveys the divine guidance in the Qur'an. He adopts this meaning. He says, that is, مَا نَزَلَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِمْ فِي الزِّكَرِ So, the term zikr is used for the Qur'an. Inna anzalna ilayka zikr. We send this reminder, so he says, the guidance God Almighty revealed as a reminder. He elaborates that guidance further. Mimma umiru bihi wa nuhu anhu wa widu wa uidu. That is, the things they are directed to follow, the things they are told to follow, and what they are stopped from, and what's promised to them, or the glad tidings given to them, what they are warned with, or punishment announced for them. So this is the content that he stated. This is what the Qur'an comprises, the warning and punishment, what's to be practiced and what's to be avoided. That is the aspect of inzar, warning, and God's sharia, or directive, or guidance, is also included in it. So all of it is stated, and it is said, that this is what's meant. He didn't say anything about the word tabi'in. All right. Going further onwards, when I present the analysis done by Ibn Ashur, it'll become clear that he too takes it in the same meaning as Tabari does. That is, if it meant explanation and elaboration, he wouldn't have stated the following point this way, and he wouldn't have stated the explanation and elaboration in view here, as you'll see ahead. So this is Zamakshari's viewpoint, and I've already stated Tabari's viewpoint. Next, let's see what Imam Razi says. Imam Razi quoted the verse, and as per his style, he writes, Wafihi Masail, and now he discusses each point in it. So the first issue he states is Zahiru Hazal Kalam, that is, he says regarding this verse that if we keep in view what appears from the words of God Almighty, like the words as they appear to us, Zahiru Hazal Kalam, Yaktazi Anna Haza Zikr Muftahirun, Ila biyani Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is, this reminder is dependent on the Prophet, peace be upon him, clarification of it. Wal muftakiru ilal biyan mujmal. And what depends on explanation or elaboration is mujmal. Obviously, for him the issue becomes whether the entire Quran is mujmal, that which the Prophet, peace be upon him, would explain and elaborate on. He debated this issue further and discussed Qiyas as well. But the point that becomes clear from this is that he's taking it in the meaning of explanation and elaboration. That is, now we have an opinion of a great exegete who views the verse differently from how it was seen by the above two exegetes. When you take it to mean that he would explain and elaborate, he would offer details for the abridged form in the Quran. He would bring out the latent aspects of it, this is the same meaning for which you had read the translation that he would explain and elaborate on it. Therefore, in the end, let's also see Ibn Kathir's view. He stated the same point clearly. He says this guidance, or this word, that is, the Qur'an, O oh, Prophet, it was revealed to you for this reason. فَاتُفَسِّرُ لَهُمْ مَا أُجْمِلَا وَتُبَيِّنُ لَهُمْ مَا أُشْكِلَا That is, you must detail whatever is mujmal for them and anything containing a doubt or difficulty, and any point not understandable, 
should be clarified to them. So he stated the point that the Quran states this very responsibility of the Prophet, that is, he would detail out its abridged form, and he, after removing their doubts regarding the Quran, he would make everything clear. So we learn that Imam Razi and Ibn Kathir share the same opinion. Note here that the first two exegetes had a similar approach, and the other two exegetes adopted the other approach. The two aspects that were... That is, they aren't stating both aspects as we generally observe. Rather, they've stated their individual choices. The reason for preference wasn't stated. That is, if there are two approaches, or if a word is used in two aspects, then the reason for their preferences should be stated. Therefore, it becomes necessary for us to look at those who have gone into its analysis, what is their take on it. A renowned exegete of our times, Ibn Ashur, in the Arab world, dealt with this aspect in his exegesis. That is, he explained how we would see the complete verse by considering both these aspects. With that, we also get an idea of the point that becomes the reason for preference in the word itself. So, now I would present their explanations to you. He says that the first point that should be understood is that when we determine about manuzila alahim, whether it's the same zikr or is it something different from it, when we say, O oh, Prophet, we have revealed this zikr or this reminder towards you so that you make the tabi'in or elaboration of whatever has been revealed to them. So, whatever was revealed towards them, is it the same as zikr? Or is it the same Qur'an? He says the words mentioned demand that it shouldn't be the same Qur'an or Zikr. First, he mentions this, and then he states its reason. The reason he gives is that if this was the intended meaning, then the pronoun should have been used. That is, the words of Ma Nuzila Alayhim should have been used. There's a reason why the sentence is mentioned. It might have been said, لِتُبَيِّنَهُ nas. That is, it was mentioned earlier that we revealed a zikr to you. And further, it could have been stated that the reason why we revealed it is that it be elaborated to the people. So, instead of saying it be elaborated, the words ma nuzila alayhim are mentioned. That is, it said that the thing revealed to them should be elaborated. All right. This style indicates that this must be a different thing compared to the former. That is, it shouldn't exactly be the Qur'an or az zikr First, he states this point. Then he also states his preferred point. He says, فَلَحْسَنْ أَيْنْ يَكُنَ murad بِمَا نُزِلَ عَلَيْهِمْ أَشْشَرَيْ أَلَّاتِ أَرْسَلَ اللَّهُ بِهَا مُحَمَّدًا صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَجَا عَلَى الْقُرَانَ جَامِيًا Laha wa mubayyina laha. Then it is better to interpret ma nuzila alayhim as not the Quran, not a zikr. Rather, the laws which God Almighty has revealed in the Quran in the form of His guidance, directives, the do's and don'ts, and which were given to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Quran contains the collection of all those laws, and the Quran states them. So it is said that the Quran revealed to you is a zikr or the reminder, and the religion, the guidance, the do's and don'ts stated in it, the Prophet, peace be upon him, must communicate them to the people. So he says it should be taken this way. Since Ma Nuzila Alayhim is stated separately and the pronoun wasn't used, it's a better comprehension. So you see how he's establishing his preference? It's a better interpretation. That is, He's not insisting that this would be the interpretation under all circumstances. He says, Falahsan, this is better. Now, obviously, the question that arises here is, what's the meaning in which tabin is used? He says, Wa isnadu tabin ilan nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi itibar annahul mubaligu linnas haza al bayan. Therefore, the term tabin here is in the context of preaching. All right. That is, here it's said that it's the Prophet himself who would spread the tabian or its statement, since the sharia and guidance are clearly stated in the Qur'an. Who takes this to the people? It's the Prophet, peace be upon him. So tabian is used in the sense of preaching here. 
That is the very first aspect we discussed. And then see with which point of view the whole thing has been stated, in which the rationale for the command also becomes clear. That is, why the punishment is being stated here and why the reduction is being made there. Why is it being dealt with using forgiveness and leniency? Why is the reduction being made there? There it has been made. It implies the same. That is, first, he states the preference for it. That is, according to him, the style that has been adopted here is that it shouldn't be construed as the Quran entirely. He says it should be considered as Gairu Zikril Mutaqaddam. That is, it is in disagreement with the former. Obviously, he implied the content or the guidance of the Quran with it rather than the Quran as it is. Now he says, it is indeed the Quran that is meant by it, that is, Ainul Zikril Munazal. That too has been said. So now he asks why the pronoun wasn't used. The reason he cites is that in the first part, the objective was to say that this Zikr was directly given to the Prophet. Note the words used, Inna Anzalna Ilaika Haza Zikr, or Inna Anzalna Alaika Zikr. That is, first, it was said that the Prophet was given directly. Now it has reached people through the Prophet. Hence, this is the objective for which the words Ma Nuzila Ilaihim were repeated. All right. He has stated a reason that is, when he initially asked why wasn't the pronoun used, here it's said that if this exegesis is to be done, then we must first accept that this has been the objective of it. First, the objective was to say that it was given to the Prophet directly. Now the objective is to say that it must be communicated through the Prophet. Yes, sir. It must reach other people. So he says, if taken from this aspect, Fal Murad bit tabi'in ala haza, tabi'inu ma'afil Qurani min al-mani, then tabi'in would imply elaborating the Qur'an's meaning. To state the purport of the Qur'an, the point which is latent in the Qur'an, what are the aspects of guidance in it which are to be explained? So, he states another meaning. That is, he analyzed it and said, if you take it as the being the Qur'an itself, that is, for ma nuzila ilayhim, that is, the objective complement of a verb, if taken in the Qur'an's meaning, then it's better to take it in the sense of explanation and elaboration. And if we take it in the meaning of the Qur'an's guidance, then it's better to interpret the verb tabi'in as stating or preaching or to communicate and familiarize. So you saw how this entire debate was stated by our exegetes. So we have seen it, however, after seeing it, all we can say is that a preferential taste comes to the fore. That is, we don't reach a decisive conclusion. We may choose from either of these, but the way Ibn Ashur stated, so a reader might say that he is inclined towards a certain choice, while another might prefer something else. That is, we may choose as per our choice the sentence's construction, and say a similar word like fal ahsan as used by him. It's in the exegesis of scholars, and the way Ibn Ashur reviewed and analyzed it was presented too. Now, I'm saying that we should refer further to the context and backdrop. That is, does the backdrop and context bring us to the same point? That is, you may take either of the two aspects, or does the context and backdrop become decisive here? Let's refer to the verse. So, I'm picking out the same verse, number 44. Listen to the verse again. When I read the verse, that is verse 44 of Surah Nahl, I had read verse 43 before it. That is its context. That is, what is it under discussion? Is the point of discussion that God Almighty says that we have been sending prophets and the need for sending the prophet is that he explains and elaborates my book? Is this the topic? For example, if the topic of religion or of guidance or the explanation and elaboration of the Quran is being discussed back and there it's being told that this is why prophets are sent. That is, a book is revealed to them and he elaborates that book to the people, teaches it, presents its exegesis, expounds it like you read out that he explains and elaborates it. Is this the topic or is this point discussed earlier? You see, it's not under discussion at all. That is, 
When we place the verse in its context, we find that this topic isn't under discussion at all. That is, the topic isn't that the prophets are sent so that they explain and elaborate the book of God Almighty. The topic under discussion is that the audience is demanding that why don't angels come to them with this message. If you read from the earlier passages, this is the point under discussion. Why don't the angels come? That is, when they can come to Muhammad, peace be upon him, or they have come to other prophets, so angels should come, and if they can come to you, they may come to us and bring us the book of God Almighty. This is the question, the objection, or a foolish demand. This is what is being presented by the audience. What does the Quran say in reply? They insist that angels be sent down to them. This is the continuity of the message from before. In reality, before you too we had sent men as messengers. This is the topic. Earlier too, whenever messengers were appointed, they were men. They were human beings. That is, we never sent angels as messengers. In reality, before you too we had sent men as messengers to whom we would send revelations. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُهِي إِلَيْهِمْ It was stated, فَاسَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So if you people don't know, ask those before this, the recipients of the reminder. That is, this is the extent to which this topic is discussed, that who had been bringing God's message before too. A person has taken something from someone's field on the way. Someone has plucked some fruit from someone's garden. Will all these be subject to cutting off the hand? Are they included? Are they to be removed on the logic that earlier God Almighty had stated this punishment? At that time, all of them were included. Later, some evidence is required to exclude them. We send them with arguments and books. That is, it was the prophets who came, and the prophets were told the arguments in the light of which they presented their dawah, and they were revealed the books. This has been our way. Now, after stating this way, the verse follows. What is the verse? Wa anzalna ilaikas zikra li tubayina li nasma nuzila ilayhim. And now we reveal this reminder to you for the same reason. That is, now we have chosen you with the same objective with which we have been choosing before too. That is, my message will be communicated by people chosen from among you human beings. Your selection has been made based on the same principle, and what was their responsibility? To convey my message as they were my messengers. Your responsibility is the same. Now you see it becomes absolutely clear from the context that here it's used for stating, conveying, and making people familiar with it. Explanation and elaboration don't factor in in this case. If there was a deficit in it, then the words that followed after it fulfilled that deficit too. It was stated, وَلَا أَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَرُونَ So that they may reflect. The people should reflect upon it. The people should reflect upon it to understand it. If the Prophet had to do all this and hand it to them, then the words which follow wouldn't remain relevant. So, look at the context and the backdrop. It totally supports our line of reasoning here, that is, the word tabi'in here, hasn't come in the sense of explanation, elaboration, or exegesis. It has been used for statement or communication. Now, in conclusion, I would present to you the point of view of Imam Farahi. Ramdi Sahab, before we go on to what Maulana Farahi says on this, please do clarify a small point. All the exegetes were arguing on the point of why Ma Nuzila Ilahim has come separately. That is, the pronoun would have sufficed, and they stated their preferences. So, what, according to you, was the advantage of bringing in the phrase Ma Nuzila Ilahim, and what's behind the omission of the pronoun? According to me, the objective is the same which Zamak Shari and Tabari stated, and which Ibn Ashur himself preferred. That is, here, Ma Nuzila Alaihim is not for a zikr, rather, it is for the guidance of the Quran. That is, this reminder was revealed. Now the religion of God is stated in it. The Prophet was to communicate this religion. Now you see whatever was stated in it was read out in the form of the Quran and it was shown practically 
And if a short directive was given for some point, like we have explained many times that the Abrahamic religion would be followed. So the entire Sunnah was also taught by the Messenger, peace be upon him, of God. So it is actually the conveying of the religion, the communication of the religion. Therefore, the way Zamakshari elaborated the word to which the pronoun returns was omitted. The complete point is such, Ma nuzila ilayhim fihi, O Prophet, we reveal this reminder towards you so that whatever in it was revealed for them, you may state it to them. The point being stated earlier is the same. The guidance given to them, the message brought by the Prophet, they say that if this guidance was to be communicated to us, then an angel could have brought it. So, it was said that earlier too, we appointed prophets, and those prophets are from among human beings. Likewise, they're furnished with arguments as well as the books, and it was their mission to go and communicate this divine guidance to you. This prophet was designated to the position so that he conveys my guidance to you. Now, you must reflect on this guidance. If a point needs clarity, get it clarified. If a point needs contemplation, you must do so. If a point requires pondering, that has to be done by you. The point is clear. The entire argument is stated in that very context. And this discussion has no effect on it. This point was elaborated by Ibn Ashur too. Now, let's see how Imam Farahi states this. As the complete backdrop has been dealt with by me, we would simply read his excerpt and explain it. I am reading it from Taliqat, and verse 44 of Surah Nahal is under discussion. First, he quoted the verse, لِتُبَيِّنَا لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِيلَ إِلَيْهِمْ Isn't this the verse? He says, Al-Murad مِنَ التَّابِينَ هَهُنَا هُوَ الْبَلَغُ mubin. What does tabin imply here? Balagul mubin. That is, to convey the point in full detail. So, you see, Balagul mubin, the verb used here, is tabin. He has clarified that as well. That is, it implies why this verb is used. Why wasn't the verb tablih used here? So that it's said there shouldn't be any deficiency in its communication. It should be communicated. He gives his reasoning further. That is, obviously he has stated one meaning of it. He says, Kama jafi surati ali imran. The same verse I had presented, if you recall. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِيسَاقَ الَّذِينَ أُتُوا الْكِتَابِ لَا تُبَيِّنُنَّهُ لِلنَّاسِ وَلَا تَكْتُمُونَهُ The same verse which we discussed, that is verse 187, that is, here it comes against concealment and is used in the same meaning in which it was used in Ali Imran's verse, that is, to state something and convey it to the people. He further elaborates, وَلَيْسَ الْمُرَادْ بِهِ الشَّرْ وَالتَّفْسِيرِ here, it doesn't imply explanation or elaboration. The expansion and clarification to elaborate on it isn't meant here. He further says, Fa inna zalika, since the explanation or elaboration, Fa inna zalika lam yakun farzan ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This wasn't obligatory for the Prophet, peace be upon him. That is what was obligatory for the Prophet, Balagul Mubin, to communicate the guidance of the religion that it should be elaborated and expounded wasn't the Prophet's, peace be upon him, responsibility. However, the Prophet had nonetheless carried out, Tabin, we are discussing this very thing, so he says, فَكُلُوا مَا بَيِّنَهُ نَبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَلَى سَبِيلِ التَّفْسِيرِ فَمِنْ جِهَةِ نُسِي وَرَافَتِهِ So, whatever elaboration the Prophet, peace be upon him, did, was out of sheer sympathy and mercy of the Prophet. That is, for his ummah, his companions and followers, the extreme sympathy and mercy he had, the feeling Prophet, peace be upon him, had for their well-being, if he thought something necessary, he explained it. It wasn't his responsibility to formally organize classes for its explanation. This responsibility of the Prophet was not stated in the Qur'an. And in this verse too, explanation and elaboration aren't implied. What's meant is balagi mubin, or complete communication of it. The same thing I gave reasons for, he stated it in full detail. Following this, he draws additional attention. That is, I clarified the real reason for preference, which is the context and backdrop. So, he draws further attention. وَالْكَرِينَ عَلَىٰ هَذَا الْتَعْوِيلِ أَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ 
لم يمكنه في التفصيل إلا نظر يسير That is, its further justification is Look at the corpus of the narrations. There would be a few verses where the Prophet stated their elaboration. This situation itself tells that if this had been the responsibility, then there would have been dossiers all around. Entire exegesis would have existed. There's no such thing. He further says, وَلِذَلِكَ تَرَى أَحْلَى التَّعْوِيلِ مُخْتَلِفِنَا اِخْتَلَفَانْ كَسِيرًا It is the consequence of it that the exegetes had to write the exegesis afterward. and you see how greatly they differ in their opinions. If the Prophet had detailed each and everything, then who would have dared to go against it? So, he presented factual evidence of it. He further says that, وَآيزَان مَا جَا بَعْدَ هَذِهِ الْجُمْلَ هُوَ قَوْلُهُ تَعَالَى This point is also worthy of further attention that immediately after this sentence, God Almighty said, وَلَا أَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ and for the reason that they reflect. فَلَوْ فَسَّرَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ لَهُمْ فِي بِيَانِهِ كِفَايَتُنَ الْتَفَقُّ That is, had the Prophet, peace be upon him, done the exegesis of مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ in every way, then what was the need to say لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ Then the Prophet's statement and explanation would have sufficed for them. Then there was no need for reflection. So, This is Imam Farahi's statement, that is, he highlighted some other aspects as well and elaborated the issue clearly. He goes on to write about verse 64 further. There too the same word is mentioned. It's stated, Li tubayyina lahu min lizikhtalafu fi. That is why. Why is the book revealed? We've mentioned the reason many times that it decides about the disagreements. He says that in this verse, 64 of Surah Nahl, it comes further onwards. Verse 64 also states that وَلَيْسَ الْمُرَادِ أَنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى لَمْ يُنَزِّلْهُ إِلَّا لِيُفَسَّرَهُ النَّبِي It doesn't imply that God Almighty gave it to the Prophet, peace be upon him, for the reason that he carries out its exegesis. It isn't meant here. Rather, it implies that the Quran removes differences among people in every possible way. Hence, the Qur'an is the tabian of guidance in itself. It is its statement. The work of a prophet, peace be upon him, is that he takes it across to others. This sums up the reasoning on which I hold the opinion that in this verse, there isn't much refuge for those who opine that it was the official responsibility of the prophet, peace be upon him, to provide the exegesis of the Qur'an to carry out its elaboration. This wasn't the prophet's responsibility. It was the sheer mercy, kindness, and empathy of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who was the first and most important person to provide the divine and flawless guidance as the bearer and prophet of the religion. What's recorded in a hadith, that guidance must be approached as a great treasure and transmitted to the people. However, to assume it as the Prophet's, peace be upon him, obligatory responsibility is not proven by the Quran. Ghamdi Sahab, the entire discussion took place in the most beautiful manner. I wish to tell you a point. A question came to my mind during these two sessions. That question was that for such a scholarly and profound topic, a word has so and so meant in the lexicon. It has two aspects, followed by the sentence's composition. No matter what Ghamdi Sahab says about it, it wouldn't stop me from asking the question, If God Almighty had to say this, why did he put this point in so many layers? Why use such a difficult word which resulted in such differences? Especially so when such a big point was being stated. Was it the Prophet's responsibility or not? And half the Ummah construing it as his responsibility? He could have just said it in a way that wouldn't result in differences. Among them, two exegetes, especially Tabari and Zamakshari, were presented by Ghamdi Sahab. They take tabyin in the first meaning, which is that of revealing something or making it manifest. Gamdi Sahab's point of view has emerged clearly. We will continue this discussion and try to understand what our principles mean in this entire... This is why we repeatedly emphasize that these debates must start with the word. We should look at the sentence's composition and after that, we should see the arrangement, the context and the backdrop in the Quran, which decides unequivocally This is because the Book of God is univocal in its discourse. Whatever is stated there is done with absolute certainty. 
We are the ones prone to making mistakes in understanding it. It is our understanding which sometimes, due to lack of knowledge or inadequate reflection, makes a mistake. God Almighty communicated His words with complete clarity. Gamdi Sahab, the point is clear. Whatever inference you have drawn from it is also subjected to criticisms. One by one, we shall present those criticisms to Gamdi Sahab. The time ends at this moment. We shall be back again in your service. Thank you very much for your time till now.